Um, so uh, for for this session, for the remaining uh, uh, one and a half hour before lunch, we wanted to look at the, the options that we have for uh, data visualizations. Okay, uh, if uh, so, should we start? Okay. Yeah, so uh, there are three ways that we can create visualization. We, we can check the data here. The first one, the most sim the simplest one, are the options that are available in, uh, in SQL dashboard here. We can look at survey responses. We can look at GPS data. But it's fairly limited, the flexibility that you have to uh, basically just uh, filter the data, choose only a certain ra time range, and so on. Then uh, we will first look at those, and after that we look at uh, uh, Kibana. We looked at the data yesterday, and we ch uh, checked the Discover tab that showed us all the uh, data that's stored in the database. Uh, we will be uh, okay. Let me close this. We will be look at uh, we will be looking at the, mm, uh, the visualize and the dashboard tab right now, and then see how you can create visualizations, how you can mix them to put them together to create dashboards, and then set the dashboard to, di to automatically refresh the data for periodically, like maybe every five minutes, every one hour, and so on. We will look at how uh, we can create custom graphs. Uh, it's a bit more complex. That's going to be after uh, lunch using a tool called Vega that you basically can describe the graph that you want to create, just write how you want to create the data, how you want to uh, modify them. And uh, the, the, the last option, of course, is exporting data uh, in raw uh, CSV files or other formats and load them into the, uh, into the system that you want to analyze the data. So uh, the first one, if you, uh, the first one that I want to look at is the geolocation data here. This is a very simple visualization that allows uh, to plot the GPS data that we have collected in only two uh, formats, either heat map or temporal data. I'll go to study 73. That's one of the sample studies here. If you, I'm going to close this one. Uh, the, we have data from this study as well, but the, the ones from sample studies, they are go, go back longer. They show trips and like. <laughs> different parts of the world and are more exciting to look at those. Here, if you look at the, the data from, for our study, it's mostly this room and the hotel, and then this room and the hotel. So it's not as exciting. So here, if, we, if I expand here in the sample studies, physical activity sample study, and if I click on sensor data, click on geolocation, there are three participants here. Uh, one, I think one of them is me. The other two, both of them are Nate. Uh, so, and he has been to more places, so let's go with his data. And we can say from June 1st to June 26th, we can pick a range and then ask it to plot the data as a, as a heat map. We selected a, a very a wide range. I think based on what we talked about, this had to calculate the, uh, the, this graph for, uh, I believe for, uh, 80,000 records per week times around four weeks. That's like nearly uh, 300,000 records or so. One thing that you can see that yeah, some time was spent in Boston area, some time in Saskatoon. And if we zoom in, you can see that in this city where most of the time was spent. This is only for one participant. You can add the other two as well. And then the heat map will be should include the Toronto region as well. It still is working. And, or you could choose all participants. Yeah, you can see that it includes Toronto region, Boston, and uh, here, Saskatoon. Yeah. All the places visited, the roads, and so on. One thing that you need to consider is that this uh, doesn't allow you to filter the data by accuracy, and it by default assumes that the accuracy uh, that it, it, uses, uh, it uses every record that has accuracy 100 meters or better. 
That's why if you put the phone somewhere and leave it for a few days and come back and plot the data, it might show a bit more noise than you expect. But we will see that how you can plot the data with a bit more control over them in Kibana. We can create the exact same graph, but also apply a, a, a more fi fine-tuned uh, date limits uh, or and also the accuracy uh, uh, um, uh, filter on that as well. Alternatively, you could choose temporal, but temporal requires uh, only one participant because then it shows the, the path that's taken. Uh, I'm gonna delete these two and choose just one day because then it's gonna be a bit harder to analyze this. Uh, for example, last Wednesday and Thursday, temporal, if I plot this, yeah, you can see that like it's hard to see, but yeah, I did just like I dro drove from Waterloo to Toronto and then from there flying to Saskatoon and then I spent uh, some time here. This is just a simple visualization to, uh, to see if you put the GPS data uh, in, uh, in the order that's recorded and you plot them in the map, you can get exactly the readings that people have, uh, have moved. I'm just going to quickly go through the other two options for surveys as well and go to Kibana. We can do a lot more work there and, uh, and look at every data source and start plotting the data there. Yes. That's not. But there are uh, services that have uh, recorded the um, physical location of all the uh, routers. Uh, some of them are available commercially that they have location for all the access points in, in, in across the country. Some of them are more uh, restricted to a building. For example, I know that the U uh, uh, University of Saskatchewan has the location of every access point and they're like which room they're located, which floor they're lo located and so on. And knowing the proximity to that Wi-Fi, you can not only uh, uh, estimate that which building they're at, but which floor of the building they're at. And that's why it becomes a lot more helpful uh, to use that for uh, location estimation. Yes, yeah, it doesn't require, the GPS data doesn't require internet connectivity. Wi-Fi also doesn't require internet connectivity. You can be offline and still you can collect Wi-Fi data because it just scans the Wi-Fi networks in proximity and stores them. The other thing that I have to mention with respect to your question is that when we go to Kibana and we look at the data, you will see that for GPS uh, data source, there is something called provider, which says that where this location data uh, was coming from, whether it was, cal it, it was uh, received from a satellite reading, which means that that's actually the GPS sensor, or it was estimated based on um, the, the Wi-Fi uh, access point. That, that is marked as network. So you can basically go to GPS data and say, only show me the data that's coming from the provider network. Uh, we'll look at it in, in, in a bit. If I forget, please uh, remind me. Uh, you will, those ones usually have the uh, accuracy of 20 meter meters or so, while, wi -fi, while GPS can go down to even uh, two or three meters or even one meter. Those basically are calculated using the same commercial service that Google or Apple offer that have the exact location of every access, access point across the country, and then they get the access point readings, and then based on that, they calculate the location, and they just give you the location, the final coordinate. Anything you wanted to, to uh, add? Maybe? You said uh, if they're noting that most of the viewers during the summer months are connected. So most notably, I'm thinking um, the section of Wi-Fi access. So, so with with Wi-Fi, mobile browsers can see how what the signal is spreading. Not on iPhone, yeah. Okay. Yeah. And an interesting thing there is that if you add beacon data source or Wi-Fi data source or GPS data source, all three of them, both on Android and 
iPhone, of course, Wi-Fi doesn't work on iPhone, but for the other two and, of, and for all three of them on Android, they ask for location permission. Because uh, as I said, the, all these three types of data, they can be used to infer the location. So when you ask for this data source, the participant will be told that this app wants to access your location. So. So the other one is uh, looking at the responses. Okay, let's see why this doesn't fit. Okay, yes, here. We can, for example, here choose again one or more participants, and I will choose. I, there are a lot of responses here, and unfortunately, this page doesn't support uh, pagination. It tries to load all of them. It's one of the limitations here, and because the study has been going on for, I think, four years or so, and they're like nearly thousands of responses submitted. When I try to load it, it gets really slow, so I'm gonna just choose uh, one of them, physical activity barriers with display responses. And here you can see that all the responses, when they show up, the responses, the images that are submitted with those responses like this, the, read, uh, the I think the question in the survey was that can you, put, uh, if a participant was asked to submit a photo and their assessment of any barriers to the physical activity. Of course, this person wasn't happy with the door in front of him. Uh, so that's the. Uh, okay. That's that's a that's a that's truly a barrier. Yes. That's So we can spend the rest of the time going through this one by one, and Nate can tell us stories about them, but. <laughs> Narrative. Yeah. Narrative. Narrative, sorry, yes. Uh, yeah, but let's, let's uh, or, or we can just hear him talking about it. The door is locked. So it, it's it's actually uh, uh, yeah it supports physical activity it doesn't <laughs> yeah uh, yeah so we don't have to talk about them one by one there are recordings for that you can go on to your uh, afternoon and watch and listen to them uh, yeah one one other limitation here actually like if you want to download survey responses you can go here and press download as either CSV or JSON. Uh, this is, there is a limitation here. We, when we download as CSV, it basically formats the data that's very easy to read if you want to open it in Excel and, uh, and other similar tools. But it's not very easy if you want to load it into uh, SAS or SATA and other ones. The data internally are stored in a way that's actually very easy to, because, uh, to, to use it in other databases. Like for example, all time use data, all the time stamps are recorded in UTC and are in the proper format and all the values are properly uh, stored. But the, the, when you try to download it here, there is this limitation here. We are working on improving this. So if you try to download the CSV file and you see, oh, you, there's no way you can process it in, in SAS, that's the reason we can definitely talk about it, how we can uh, format the data better that can be read by scripts in, in other tools. We talked about the geotagging of surveys as well. That's where the surveys are responded. That we, we mentioned that's different uh, location information required than collecting GPS data source uh, or location data source. Uh, this page, the response map, basically provides, uh, uses that 
geotag surveys to, to show the survey responses in a map. So here I can, again, check the, uh, pick the same participant, the same survey, and see where, uh, where were these barriers to the physical activity. It takes a bit time. Okay, you can see that it says that 108 responses are not shown because they didn't have any location data. So there is a the possibility that when you're trying to respond to that survey, if the person refuses to grant the GPS permission or the place they are at, there is no GPS uh, data available, that survey response will not be geotagged. And that's why it's not shown here. Of course, in this set, there were like 108 of them. Uh, Yes, yeah, if I zoom out, it should appear here. Yeah. Yeah, there you, go. Okay. you can see that there are, there, there, every country has some barriers to the physical activity. So that's, <laughs> that's the takeaway. <laughs> so it's not limited to Canada. Okay. Yeah. And here you can more specifically see the ones that are happening next to this. Yeah. There is something, there's some, there are some issues here as well. Okay. So, uh, and before we go to uh, look into some of these uh, data visualizations more in Kibana, I also wanted to show if you want to export the data, you can use the data export tab here. Uh, you can click on new uh, to create a new data export. If it's one of those, uh, uh, those data sources that generates a lot of data, that we, we talked that because of their, vo their high volume, we couldn't store them in, the, uh, in Elastic and so show it in Kibana. You will see that when you want to export it, you also have to export it. You can say, for example, for magnetic field is one of those that generates millions of records per month. So you can only choose one participant at a time and also one month. You can say, for example, show me the data for 2016 February. You can tell the system that give me data from all the participants for these three years. The reason is that the, the uh, file that it generates, the CSV file, can easily go over 10 gigabytes of size in compressed format. And that is really hard for us to store it and for, for you to download it and analyze it. And so basically the limitation here is because uh, if you want to access this type of data, probably exporting it as a file is not the best option. We have to find a different way. Like you probably need the direct access to the, da to the database that stores this raw data. But ba other than this, other than this raw motion sensor data, every other sensor data, like for example, GPS, you can choose all the participants and you can, oh sorry, let's click close this. And you can choose a, a range. Okay, I don't know why this doesn't show these. Okay, so if I, for example, choose Wi-Fi, it's okay, let me refresh the page, sometimes it happens. Okay. GPS, this participant. Yeah, so, and from November, I can say from November uh, 9th, 2015 to this date, in CSV format. If it's GPS, it gives you a couple of other formats as well, like KML, GPX, these formats that you can use them in uh, uh, Google Earth and other uh, uh, location processing applications. It's gonna take a while if I ask for four years of data, I'm gonna make it a bit shorter. Uh, so maybe 2018. Uh, this one doesn't, it's not finished right away. It's pending means it's right now it's working for to export this data. It happens in the background in the servers to just generate the file. When it's ready, there will be a link to download that. I'm not exactly sure how, how long it takes. Yeah, this one right now here is still pending. We'll check this later to see when the data is available. You can, we can then download that CSV file and open it uh, with a text editor. operation. 
yeah, now it's available. Uh, there are a couple of other exports as well, like for example, this one that is from 2015 to 2019 for four years. I can download this. You can see it's around 19 megabytes compressed versus the other one is around 11 megabytes. So I think most of the, the, the bulk of the GPS data was for the past year. So Just before we continue, we can just, I, I can open this here in a text editor. Uh, and if I go to download here, I can see that this is a CSV file. Uh, you know exactly where I want to see it. Okay, sorry. Uh, this one is GPS, yes, yes. So uncompressed. The size of this uh, is around 257, uh, 50, yeah, 257 megabytes. And I can go here to download. I don't know why it doesn't show. We have to split this differently. If I open this. I hope it opens it because sometimes if it's file, the text file is too long, uh, too large, it, it has trouble showing up. Okay, yeah. You can see that it has a study ID, user ID, device ID, and some other information that we also have access to the same information in Kibana, in Kibana as well, but it's a lot easier, of course, to filter them to the map. Uh, okay, so. That's everything I wanted to talk about in, uh, visualizations that we have already implemented in in, uh, uh, in Epica. But for most of the day, we will focus on the, uh, well, for most of this session, we'll focus on the visualizations that we can create in, uh, in Kibana. Kibana is an open source tool, so if you actually search in, uh, in YouTube, there are a lot of tutorials and trainings that how you can uh, visualize the data with that. We just gonna check, we, we just gonna do, uh, uh, well, do, do a quick overview of that. We already learned how we can, uh, how we need to create index patterns. Basically, that's an ex way that, that we can connect to uh, to the data. One thing that I have to mention before uh, we go further is that here we have something called workspaces. You probably see on the left side. For every user in Ethica, we create. Uh, one personal workspace in Kibana, and then for every study, we also create one workspace. The difference between personal workspace and the study workspace is that whatever you create in your personal workspace, any visualizations, any uh, graphs and everything, it's just gonna be for yourself. You can't share it with others. But if you create anything in, uh, in the study workspace, it's immediately shared with everyone else who has access to that study. So. We all have access to study 780. I'm just gonna switch my workspace from my personal workspace to this one, 780. You can see that it says here, current workspace is uh, Ethica study 780. Now, whatever I create, if you also go to, to this interface, you see the visualizations that I've created and you can modify them and edit them as well. But of course, because it's a different workspace, now if I go to index patterns, you see it's empty because the other ones that I had created was in the other workspace, in my personal one. I can switch back, but, uh, but for now, I just want to create all of these in, in here. Uh, okay, so I start by, uh, the first data source that we want to look at, let's start with uh, GPS. So because we are we're looking at it in the, in Epica as well, and we talked that we want for the time filter we have to say to record time, create index pattern. If we come here, I extend it to be for the past seven days, and you can see that of course if it's mostly from this, I can just uh, click and drag here to select a custom range here that's for. Uh, June 24th, around 6 a.m. 
one thing that I mentioned was that that some of the uh, that these GPS data have a one value called uh, provider, and you can see that it's either GPS network or network passive or the other one. You can just simply click on visualize here, and it tells you what percentage of these. I'm just going to collapse this one. Are with like most of the data are coming from GPS, smaller subset of smaller subset is from network. Network is basically the location data that's calculated using Wi-Fi. Yes. And then the uh, network passive, GPS passive, and Fuse passive. These are different methods of calculating it. I think there's a description of that, of all of them in the documentation, that what each of these means. So, so for this, we just want to focus on, uh, on on the visualize tab and the dash on the dashboard tab the two that we have here first let's create a few visualizations if you have any ideas that you would like us to try here just just let me know okay I'm, I have I don't have any slides for this I'm gonna try a few items that I I have I, I, I know they're interesting but if you can't think of anything just let me know and then we can try it here the first one that we can do is to, if, you, if I click here, create visualizations, it gives me a few options, basic charts like area, heat map, and a few other ones. Uh, because we are dealing with location data, I'll use coordinate maps. Region map is a different one. It creates map uh, of a region, uh, but it needs the data to be, st we store the data in uh, coordinates, latitude and longitude. But for this one, the data should be stored as, as geo shapes. It's a different format of storing uh, geographic data that we are not storing it that way. So that we can't use this one right now. We're going to focus on coordinate map. And you can see that it first tells you that which database, which table of data you want to connect to. I'm just going to say I want to connect to GPS. One thing that you see often in uh, Kibana is it asks you for two things, for metrics and buckets. There are videos in, 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 in YouTube that explain it very well. Uh, I try to, uh, I'll share those, the, the link for, for one of them. It's like a 10 minute video that explains it very well that what metric and uh, bucket mean in this system. But basically, it, uh, what it does, it uh, groups the data together based on a, a metric that you give it to and then apply based on a, a criteria that you give it to, and then applies a metric on that, on each bucket of data, so on every bin of data, calculates the result and shows that result. For example, here what we can do is that we can say, for, because if you want to draw a heat map, you can't say uh, draw a dot for every GPS coordinate that you have. You have to say group them based on a certain cell size, maybe for example, say five meters by five meters, create a cell size of five meters by five meters, group them together, and then for every record that falls in that region, count the, count the number and use that. Or, I don't know, calculate the maximum of the speed if you want to know how fast people were, were going on every region instead of how many records you have for every region. So for this one, for buckets, we say do it based on geo coordinates and use an aggregation of geo hash on location field. Like exactly what they mean, it's uh, like basically I say that uh, for the first one, group the data based on their geo hash and use the location field. Location field is the only field that we had here as well. If I go here on discover, you see we have a location field that stores the actual coordinates. So I say use this group them based on their geo hash. Geo hash is a function that they, that's, that's the only function that's available that groups them and, and creates the, uh, creates those buckets. And say for example, five meters by five meters, five meters here, and then next to it, five meters by five meters and so on. It basically creates that cell on the, on the map. For now I can say just use count. If I do that, you can see it shows down here. Although it uses, by default, it uses these dots. I can go to options here and say instead of scaled circle marker, use a hash, uh, use a heat map that goes from 
green to red, for example. Yeah. And instead of that, I could have said instead of count, I could have said use the maximum of C. You see that now that I said use the maximum of speed, it highlights the coordinates that are read from uh, fr from rows rather than reading. So basically, again to to talk about it one more time, for calculate for bucketing the data, like actually bucketing for GPS data is a bit trickier than other ones because you just don't want to bucket based on, you don't want to bin them based on. I don't know, for example, the time of the reading. What matters is that which coordinate they fall into. That's why your binning should be based on, uh, based on uh, this uh, geo hash of location. So it says, for example, this grid cell is five meters by five meters, the next one is another one, five meters by five meters, and so on. This is a bit more complex than the other examples that we will go through, but the, what exactly bucketing does is that it just groups the data into different bins, and then you apply a metric to that, which in this case, the metric here we put to be, uh, we said to be the maximum of speed, or the default was the c number of GPS readings that we got. Or I don't know, other examples can be maximum accuracy, for example. So around here, we have got the most accurate data available. I'll try to go through data one by one and then uh, create at least, the, for every data source that we have, create at least one or two graphs for it. Uh, but if there is anything that comes to your mind before I move to the next one, or, or even after that, just let me know. I, I am gonna do that right now. I'm gonna save this as uh, yeah, um, number of GPS readings. Okay, and now if I go to visualize, I'll have this. And if you try it on your computer, just if you just refresh it, you go to that tab, you should have this as well. And you should be able to I could do that as well. I could come here and, and share this, uh, this like code. Uh, and then when I do that, you will see, or any, anyone else who receives the data, assuming they have access to this, they see the graph. They just see the graph. They have to be a researcher. They have to be a researcher with the proper permissions, and then they will see uh, the visualization that we have created. Yeah, it gives you a, a hint here that what each of them mean. There are a lot of configurations here. I'm not gonna go through all of them, but yeah, you can choose whether this to be a snapshot of exactly the data from 24th to 26th at this stage, or you can say just save the setting of the graph and then people should be able to adjust it as they need. I'm gonna move to the next one. For example, we can look at battery. That's also a, that's probably a simpler data source to look at. So that's the time I'm going to create the connection to the table for it. I'll create an index pattern, which basically connects me to that to that table. Uh, a very simple one here that I can create is I can create a line graph to see how people's uh, like one individual, for example, battery drops or drains throughout the day. Something very easy to create right now here. I can go to line, 
I can say, okay, use the battery uh, uh, table. So what I need to do on uh, X axis is that I want to basically show the battery for every, maybe every minute is a bit too fine. Uh, like it, uh, we probably can do it once every hour. So I can say on X axis, aggregate the data on a date histogram of record time on hourly intervals. So basically I say get the record time, uh, uh, do a histogram on that on an hourly interval. So it's going to be 2 p.m. for example, it's gonna be midnight, 1 a.m., 2 a.m., 3 a.m. and so on. It will bucket the data based on that. And I can say for every bucket, what I want is the average, um, an average battery percentage. And you, we know the battery percentage is, okay, I can choose average, and the battery percentage is stored in level. Okay. So I can say uh, on y-axis, show the average of the battery level for that one, one hour beam. So if I plot this, I can choose one day, for example, 25th. And I can choose, probably I have to limit it to one participant because it averages out for all the participants and all the readings. Or I can, what I can do instead, oops, I can add a stop bucket. I can say further split the series based on user ID. It got a bit, uh, yeah. Okay, so let's limit it to just one participant, 13231. User ID is 13231. Overnight, the battery was dropping, then they charged it a bit, then dropping again, then they charged it a bit until like, what, this is like 3 p.m. Uh, of course, this participant's phone was really draining battery like crazy because from 3 p.m. to, what time is it, like 9 p.m., it went from 80% that was here to below 20%, 18% exactly. So they had to change, charge the battery like that. Again, maybe this particular use, I, I think it's your, your user ID. <laughs> I should be careful not to pick your user ID this time. <laughs> yeah, so. Uh, but it's a reflection of the fact that at the time, at the CDH was doing the study, budget collection from the start to the diversity of, of uh, data sources is more to the point, certain high demand data sources. Mm -hmm. um, so very intensive data sources. Yes, exactly. Yeah. Yeah, and that's why uh, first it took longer to charge the battery from uh, 9 a.m. it was 17 percent until 3 p.m. it went to 90 percent, but then again by 9 p.m. it was down to 18 percent again. And I, I assume this is the correct assessment there. Yeah. So one thing that I did here is that I actually divided the graph. I could have divided, uh, divided uh, like created multiple series. I could have created multiple uh, graphs as well. Basically, this allows you to add as many sub-buckets as you want. You create, you bundle the data in one layer. Okay, for example, here as we did, we said first uh, um, create, uh, calculate the histogram for record time on the first level. So that creates hours of the day. Then I say calculate the, uh, then I say split every series based on user ID. I say only pick 10 user IDs because that's the, the top 10. We only have 10 users in our study, 10 participants in our study. If there were more, 
it, uh, I could say, for example, go to 100 or anything, but there is a limit there. Like if you have like 1,000, I think anything more than 100, it can calculate. That's why you have to give it a limit and say whether do it descending or ascending order, one of these orders. And I could have also split the graph. Like I could have said, don't do this. Although I can't remember anything, any other sub bucket, but I can say, okay, split the chart in rows and columns based on something else. So I'm gonna just remove this and I can say split the chart based on terms of user ID. You can see that it created five, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven graphs. One for every participant that they have in the study. Probably should have saved that. This is terms. I'm going to save this so in case if you want to uh, to work with if you go to the to if you switch your workspace, you should be able to access this as well. The other one that, okay, I'm, uh, I will try to go through them a bit faster here. Uh, the other one is the pedometer data we can look at. Probably this more resonates with the um, topic of the workshop. Okay, so if we do that, one thing we can do is based on basically a bar, a, a bar, a vertical bar graph on the number of steps taken for every hour of the day. So here I go to vertical and I say, say I choose vertical bar. I say go to ped, uh, select pedometer, and for the bucket we want on the x-axis to show a date histogram of the record time and uh, uh, in set the interval to. Uh, each hour, and for the y-axis, we want the sum of the steps taken. Okay. Now, this is for every participant again. You can see that for uh, we don't have any data, like zero steps taken overnight, but throughout the day, uh, there are data. And now we can also, of course, uh, do a, a sub bucket here and say split the chart based on user ID. I will say terms, user ID. Now this is a bit harder to read, because, but this for, for every user ID, this is, this is the number of steps they have taken. Maybe I have to just say two, for two users. Okay, instead of 10, I say two. Uh, okay, didn't, I can pick one, for example, this 2785. Okay. So these are the uh, steps taken by user 2785, uh, uh, and you can see that at, uh, what's that, 8 p.m., that was in most number of steps taken around 4,000. And then at 9 p.m. there are a few more and so on. You can calculate the same thing for average across days and uh, like for every day, like how many on average at every hour of the day, how many steps taken. Okay. So before we go to the next one, any uh, anything so far?
so I can, of course, talk a bit about it, and Nate, maybe you can add more after that. Uh, one thing that I've, I've noticed is very helpful is to, uh, before you uh, go uh, deeper into analysis, you really have to have a sense that how the data looks like. And uh, I, I, me personally, the way that I do it is that I f first start by reading the data, like going through them line, line by line and see what are the values, what are different, uh, what are the values of uh, the fields that are available, what are different um, values that each of these fields can take. Like for example, if we talk about the RSSI and we say that that shows how close to, to uh, uh, two beacons are to each other or the beacon is to the phone. What are the values we are expecting? Is it like of how often we get a value of uh, minus one? How often we get a value of minus 512? What is the range that falls in between? So you can do it based on just, just by looking at the data here. And then you can also do it just by uh, like, for example, if you look at here, it says the speed is often zero. So you know that it's most of the time you, you, you see the speed of zero. You can visualize it. Of course, if this is mostly zero, you can exclude the zero. And then so you'll have a sense that the data that you are receiving, what are the values in that? So it helps with two things. First, it helps that if there are uh, values in the data that you can't explain, there is a problem there. Like for example, no one, like when we were looking at the step count, uh, it was 4,000 steps, the maximum at one hour. If the same value is 40,000 in one hour, I'm not sure how feasible it is. If it's 400,000, definitely not, not feasible. So there's some, there, is some issue, there are some issues there. So exploring the data as you work with, as you uh, are collecting the data, it's, it's very helpful. Uh, soon you will find visualizations that are very helpful for uh, like what they are. It's, like it's, it, it's different case by case, but you will find uh, visualizations that are uh, very helpful to make sure that you have full control over your study. So as soon as any issues arise, you will see whether in the sensor data, whether in the survey responses, whether in the participant uh, compliance or anything else that you uh, that is an integral part of your part of your study. And also, of course, Nate can talk more about it. But it also like knowing the structure of the data helps a lot when you want to go deeper in the uh, in the analysis. When you load the data in, uh, for example, uh, in R or uh, Python and you try to use it in machine learning, you need to know how the data looks like. So you can basically uh, uh, format it in the, in, the, in the shape that you need and then start running the analysis on that. Uh, I we will not be talking about the details of that, but one thing that you can do here, one option that you have here is actually run different aggregations on the data. Like for example, in this tab, uh, this basically gives you direct access to the database and allows you to write a query and say, well, fetch the data, bond, uh, like uh, uh, divide them into buckets in this format and then calculate this uh, metrics on them and show me the output. And this is basically the, the same script that you would have used if you would write a Python code or an R code. So R has, for example, connection to Elasticsearch, which is exactly received a, a, a code like this that then allows you to uh, plot them in any format that you want. Now, do you want to add any, yeah, I mean, any comment um, to that? So this visualization, uh, I think Mohammed touched on two major areas where we need to understand. Um, one of those areas is storage and data analysis. And, and as Mohammed said, um, some of the more sophisticated analytics that we've been talking about this afternoon, um, you know, they uh, their results can't be uh, thrown off or um, maybe tripped up by um, by issues uh, issues with missing data, issues with um, with values that are not just outliers.
Yeah, it, it, yeah, and uh, and uh, uh, that's re that's actually the most important feature that these these tools offer, because most of the in-depth analysis happens at the end of the study. You first do all the data collection, and then you go through to look at the data. But uh, it's really important to uh, to make sure during the data collection that everything is. Like the, that the quality of data is what you expect it to be. Because it's too late after the data collection to just go and analyze data and you see that, oh, like for technical reasons, for issue, uh, human uh, errors when setting up the study or for any other reason, the data is not what you intended for. Then nearly impossible to rerun the study. It, tools like this, uh, and, and exactly the, re the same reason that we are adding MetaBase is that it provides more flexibility on running all these queries on survey responses. 
gives you the option to always have an eye on the data with minimum effort to see exactly what is the quality of data that's coming in today. So if something is not the way that it should be, you can immediately take action and you can try to take care of it. So if I, I, I like that a lot because I, I compare it with um, just you know, a couple of examples. If you start seeing a large part of the information that's coming through is just raw data and you are hunting that directly on Comcast or Fast Data or with Back Row Info, you know, that's something that you might have to dive in and, and find out why they're big privacy concerns and you go in there and engage with the listener. Alternatively, sometimes um, sometimes it's not something like quite as technical as that. It may be something like a lot of participants are answering other for personal protective behavior because they're exercising and it's best when you know protected or something like that. And and there it's like okay are we missing certain items on our list? or getting confused about those items that are there that are leading to people to, to feel their answer doesn't fit into that rubric. Um, and uh, other times it's just people not answering data either or kind of or, or leaving an answer blank. Um, so, so those sort of things can become evident through course of analysis, but then often, and Shivana makes it very easy to say in terms of save this visualization against the data for the future, in which case it will just be updated when you come back to it, it'll be summarizing whatever data has been accumulated since the beginning, which is what we see. And I'm sure it'll be great. And even further than that, like I actually just saved these two to then, uh, now maybe we can talk about that. You can just add them to create a dashboard here. For example, I just, uh, here I come to dashboard, I say I want to create a new dashboard. And I say, well, these two visualizations that I just created, add them uh, to this dashboard. And I save it here, for example, with monitoring dashboard. Okay, now, then I can set it to auto refresh once every hour. So once every hour, it runs this query and it updates this. And I believe I can make it go full screen as well. Uh, show all the toolbar full screen. Yes. So then this can be this can update once every hour, and you can just if you have a spare monitor in your lab, you can just leave it there, and you can always have an eye on exactly how the study is progressing. Now, what are those metrics? Is different case by case. And uh, the reason that we are adding uh, metabase to this, uh, to, this integra to this list as well is that some of the metrics that people have asked, it's not easy to calculate, especially when it comes to doing more complex uh, uh, queries on survey responses. Like for example, those who responded, uh, like, like, what, uh, like those who responded the baseline survey in certain ways, what are their responses going forward or, or, uh, or other criteria. And uh, Kibana has some limitations there when it comes to uh, running more complex queries. There, uh, there is one tool that I just talked about after that, and uh, so hopefully we can finish it before lunch. Uh, but uh, it's very great. It's I think it's a very powerful tool that you can just create this dashboard, you can put these graphs here together, and you can ask for it to just refresh. I can say it to instead of one hour to be like something a bit shorter, maybe thirty seconds. And for the past. So for example, I can say it, uh, it to be 30 seconds for the past 24 hours. So it always shows the data that's coming in for the past uh, 24 hours or for the past week. And if anything is th that's not going as expected, I can immediately spot it here. One thing that's very helpful with battery data is to see if the app is operating. Now, of course, batteries are just like, uh, you can analyze it to see how the battery is drained. But more than that, we use it to see if the app is operating. Uh, because participants don't need to provide any permission to, for us to collect battery data, and they can't disable it either. We can always access it. The only way that we can't access it is if they terminate the app. That we talked about it on the first day, that they can swipe the app away from the home screen. If they do that, we don't get any battery data. So if someone 
someone doesn't provide any bad data. So maybe this graph is not very helpful. Maybe we have to uh, create a bar graph that shows the number of battery data that we get from every participant per hour. And if from one participant we don't get anything for the past 24 hours, I th that means they haven't uploaded any data. So either the app is not running or there are some. This is for a, for a study that has battery data being collected. Yes. It's a built requirement to get it. Of course, so yes. In general, um, battery is, if you don't give a graph, it's good. But you know, I, I think the same sort of metrics can be used to summarize in a word cloud what, what responses people gave to certain open-ended uh, questions. It can be used to um, characterize Yeah, we don't have any survey response for this study. That's it. But we have to switch to another study to take that. Yeah. Yeah. The same. Yeah. As you said, we can use these uh, some other graphs like uh, tag cloud, which basically creates a word cloud of all the responses. Like for example, for time use data, uh, we could create a word cloud of all the responses that are provided to uh, what you are doing question. I believe. Uh, yeah, but we have to switch this study here. Uh, I can switch to my personal workspace so I can check the data from uh, the uh, one of those sample studies. Uh, study, for example, 73, 73 survey responses. So if I come here, I should be able to look at the survey responses data for study 73 for the past, for example, one year. And sample content, fitting, uh, okay, fitting is, I, I don't know the format of this, qu this survey. I, I, th that's why I can't easily just crea create a graph for it. I'm just trying to figure out something, some uh, s survey question that has multiple options, so create, we can create a word cloud for it. It seems that question, uh, that, that is question ID one for survey ID, uh, okay, where is the survey ID? Two for two, question ID one. Okay, I can come here and I can say, okay, I want to create a tag cloud from survey responses, which tag is uh, terms of answer content draw for the top five. Uh, if I do this, and I can say question ID one is one. And survey ID is two for two. And you can easily just, you can add, you can save this, add it to your dashboard, and you can see that what are the most number of options that are chosen. Now this is of course a word cloud, you can do the same thing with the pie chart and bar chart. Uh, and, and this gets updated automatically, so you will know exactly the results coming in. So uh, we might go a bit over time, I'm just trying to quick uh, show one other option that's available here. Uh, this, these graphs are actually fairly limited in what they can, like they can do. There are two problems here. First, so just some of the graphs are, you might be looking for something that's not available here. The other thing is that uh, the data is, 
uh, might not be ready, the, the data is stored for you to plot it here. For example, uh, the app usage, we talked about it, that how uh, it period, it, like every five minutes it captures the data for the past 24 hours. You probably have to filter some of those data if you want to know uh, every day. So that data is useful if you want to know exactly what time they use what app. But you might want to have some aggregate result from them, like what, uh, how many apps they use for how long on a daily basis. If you want to do that, you need to do some uh, processing on the data. There, there is one type of graph that is supported here called Vega. I'm just going to show one simple and one a bit more complex example of that. I'm not going to go through details of it, but if anyone is interested, I would be more than happy to talk about it after that. Vega is uh, a visualization tool that's uh, developed by uh, a team from University of Washington that's um, fairly powerful in visualizing the data in uh, custom formats. Uh, their website, I believe, is, let me see, view on the show toolbar. It's vega.github. So they uh, have a lot of different examples of the visualizations that you can uh, you can create. There are two uh, two variations of it. One is Vega, that's a bit lengthier and more powerful. The other one, some, another one, is called Vega Lite, that's a bit simpler to use, especially if you are familiar with uh, uh, a visualization uh, tool called D3, and or if you are familiar with generally JSON format, that's the same format that Ethica surveys are written in. You can define your graphs uh, in this format, and it, uh, and it creates that, that plot for you. Now, for example, for a bar chart, that's a simple one, this is how basically the graph looks like. It's fairly long. The Vega Lite is a lot shorter. Uh, I'll use this to create two graphs. One is the, uh, I want to plot the data uh, that I, uh, for, for the screen time. If you remember, I talked about yesterday that we can create a plot that exactly for how often people check their phone and for how long. We can, the, none of the graphs that we have here is useful for that. We probably would want to create an event plot that every time that people turn on their phone, it creates a, a, a box or something for us. And uh, none of these ones are suitable. We will create that in Vega. It might seem a bit complex, but the big advantage there is that you only have to create a graph once. Then we can share it. Like, for example, we have created already 10 or 15 uh, Vega graphs for different visualizations. Then you create the template of the graph, that JSON file. Then you only have to change minor uh, uh, parameters there, minor criteria there, and then it will just apply to the new data. For example, this, time you, this screen time graph, I created it for another study. But since then, I've been using it on, on a lot of other studies as well. You probably have to share it in the documentation. Uh, the code for that, I believe it's written somewhere here. Let me see if I can find it. Yes, I believe it's this one. So I go here, and it tells me, OK, so describe your graph here. I'm going to paste uh, this. Let me see what workspace I'm in so I can save this. I'm going to switch to this workspace. And then I'm going to go here. And I'm going to connect to uh, ES780 screen state. Now, when I come to visualizations, I can uh, just clean, I can remove all of the content that's here. I can paste this one. Uh, basically, this says, this has multiple sections. The first section is I have to uh, separate this to data, mark, and context. It basically says that go get the data from uh, the table ES780 uh, screen state, where the time of the data is between June 24th, uh, 12 p.m. Uh, uh, until June 26th, 4 p.m. today. And then uh, only the ones that the phone is turned on. Fetch this data and then show, uh, uh, on Y axis, show the user ID, and on X axis, show the time. And then draw a tick there. 
this is basically what it explains. It says the, uh, the marker should be a six, and the encoding should be on x axis based on the rec record time, which is titled date and formatted as hour and minute, which these ways you can zoom in. And on y axis, it should be user ID, which is ordinal value, so it groups them and it shows one row for every group. And draw it picture. Now, if I plot this, This is the graph it creates for me. Which basically every line is for one user. The user ID is written on the left side. And the time is written at the bottom. But you remember that I said hour and minute. That's why it goes from, for example, 23, 1, uh, 0, 1, 2, 3. It doesn't have dates. I can easily modify it uh, to show date as, to the dates as well. Uh, it, it generates something very similar to the graph that you get from R or MATLAB, but the format is different. The format, as I said, uses the, uh, the uh, Vega format, which is uh, quite popular, but of course not as popular as, as uh, R or MATLAB yet. So this is one graph. I will save this as screen time. But this is a simple one compared to uh, some more complex graphs that can be created. I'm gonna go here. One thing that's very, uh, one graph that can be very interesting is the network graph based on the beacon data that we have collected for the past two days. We want to see how people, like we of course handed out all these beacons and we started collecting the data. We want to see how the network, uh, the, the network graph looks like. This, I'm not going to explain exactly how the graph is, partly because I also still don't understand how the graph is formatted. What I did is that I basically went to their uh, examples. I picked the one that they had for network graph. It's this one. Uh, it's quite long, and I'm not an expert in Vega still, so there's, there's a lot of details there. And mine is not as, as pretty as that one, but still, it's, it's, uh, it needs a bit more work. Uh, so this is how the graph looks like. I believe uh, this can go into the 700s. I have saved in uh, 1000s, and this can go to 700. OK. So this is the graph for the past 15 minutes. I can say, it show, I can say show the graph for the past from 24 to 26. You can, if you remember, we didn't distribute all the beacons. We only gave some of them, and we are fairly connected for the past three days. But then there are some that there's no connection to them because they're just sitting at my room. So those are completely separate. Now we can choose different ranges here. I can say, well, show me the data for, for example, over, uh, like during the overnight. Let's see, for example, say from 24th at, at uh, 19, 7 p.m. until 25th at 7 a.m. or 8 a.m. Oh, sorry. Yeah, great. Yeah. So press go. You see, there are probably some people are staying in the same place, and there are quite a few uh, uh, isolated nodes here. And you can. In previous versions of SQL, you could actually uh, download this in a format that then you could load it in Gephi, and then you could just basically, like a video, you could play it, and it would show exactly the connections as they form and they disappear over time. Uh, we actually have, uh, that was based on Bluetooth data, and because we are not using Bluetooth anymore, we are mostly relying on beacons, we have to rewrite that functionality for beacon. But for now, this pretty much serves the same purpose. Uh, this one, yeah. Th th the problem right now with this graph is that when you try to move one of them, it, they go all out of the screen. <laughs> yeah, the one, the, the one, the example that they have here, it works nicely. It stays in the screen, and of course, it takes uh, node attributes in the account as well. We talked about team ID, role ID, and those ones. You can configure it to show uh, each team with different color. So you can exactly see what the uh, connectivity between the team, uh, between the uh, members of the same team, versus what's the connectivity between, uh, 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 like across teams. Uh, well, that needs a bit more work. But the good thing is that, like, when we write the graph once, 
then you just only thing have you have to do if I come here the only thing that you need to do is to change the way that you query the data to right so it's not so well let me look let's look at the get the data here yeah so this is the graph description it's very long but you don't need to understand all of it. The only thing that we, like actually I don't understand all of it. I don't understand quite a lot of, a lot of it. But what has to be, has to change is for example, instead of saying that instead of ES780B can use another study, if you want to write a different criteria, you can write somewhere uh, here where you, uh, uh, where you do the, uh, actually I think, I think this is a criteria I set to be, a, to get some of the context. That's why we could change the time there. Uh, so if you want to, for example, add other attributes from elsewhere, you can load it here and just keep the rest of the graph the same. There are a lot of things that can be done here. It's not as easy as uh, those bar graphs that we had created. Uh, this is, of course, more complex. It needs a bit practice. But uh, we had studies that are using this very uh, uh, strongly to collect the data. One of the studies that we are uh, that uh, is uh, that's using right now beacons is with a group in uh, Leiden University in the Netherlands. I think that they have already nearly 300 uh, participants in their study and they have used this graph and a couple of other um, uh, uh, time series graphs to very uh, easily to monitor as the data come in, like if there is any problem with the data. And they have, had a, they have achieved a very high compliance rate in their study as well. Of course, they have kept a very close eye on every aspect of it. So, uh, okay, we are a bit behind, but if there's any questions uh, about this or about any of these visualizations, uh, I would love to talk about it. Let's see if I can support my Okay, so I'm gonna stop the, uh, the session here. Uh, the problem is your password to